Happy Wednesday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. You notice I said Wednesday because we're doing this before Thanksgiving. We don't want you to have uh, your Thanksgiving dinner without all the up-to-date information. So let's just talk about the numbers. Uh, nothing's really changed except Europe is worse and worse. It's actually not so much the United Kingdom now as the eastern part of Europe. Uh, and so the, a lot of the old Balkan states, uh, Czech Republic, and now Austria. Austria is the worst uh, country. You can see a huge increase in spikes in Austria, the Netherlands and UK. Italy still hanging in there okay. But now for creepy moments in Europe. <laughs> I always like creepy moments in Europe. Uh, Chancellor Schallenberg of Austria has uh, decided that the best way to manage this these people who are unvaccinated, because Austria opened up all of its uh, restrictions and, and doesn't have a good track record for vaccination. So the chancellor decided, we'll just lock up everybody who's unvaccinated. <laughs> Sounds familiar, pretty creepy for, you know, for my people. Uh, anyway, the, uh, he changed his mind, and so now they're going to do a full national lockdown for three weeks. And then, again, you got to love this, there will be a vaccine mandate for the entire country of Austria. Now, it's, it may seem a little bit overreach, but actually, <laughs> I think it's a good idea. You know, we do this for TB. You can't walk around with tuberculosis in this country. Apparently, the only disease you can walk around with and feel like you're free is COVID. Not in Austria. Mandate there. How about our friends in Japan? Remember the worst spike in the world in Japan after the Olympics? Disease is almost gone. Why? because they can follow public health measures. If we only could follow public health measures, we'd be in great shape. Well, and I've been very concerned about the United States because we've been ticking up, but it looks like we might just be lucky enough to start plateauing a bit. The worst part of the country now is Michigan. And if you look at the, the, the hot spots in the country, Michigan's the worst, parts of the upper Midwest and, and the New England states, because uh, people are going indoors. Here in the Texas Medical Center, it sort of reflects what's going on uh, nationally. Our case positivity rate has, uh, has, is, has been about 515 cases per day over the last seven days. That's up from 466, unfortunately, slight tick up. And our hospitalizations are kind of plateaued at 64. So too many cases. Remember, my view of being low at risk in, the, in this community is less than 200 cases. So I just wanted to show, share a little bit of positive news. news. Remember, we, we've uh, followed the Institute, Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation from the University of Washington. And for the first time, if you look at their projections, the United States is really kind of behaving like this. A slight increase, probably a plateau. And then you can see, as we get towards the middle of the winter, the sense is that it will begin to come down. But I do want to show you, there, the scenario here in green where it disappears, that's if everybody wore masks. That's Japan. Anyway, enough about bad viruses. We've been spending a whole time talking about COVID and how bad it is. There are some good viruses and there's some good things about viruses. So we're gonna take a look, a little trip, field trip, uh, to Tony Morosa's lab and to Joe Petrosino's lab to learn about uh, new and interesting ways that viruses can actually be used for good. So let's go. Let's all go head over to the lab. Well, we're really excited. We're here in the world of microbiology with Dr. Moresso and Dr. Petrosino, getting a chance to think about all the really good viruses <laughs> that, are, that are around. Uh, we've all been talking just about COVID and how miserable everybody is, so I thought it'd be fun to think about other, other <coughs> things that cause uh, illness, particularly bacterial pathogens and what we can do about it. So, uh, as you know, Thanksgiving's coming. It's my favorite time where we get everybody sick. Uh, there's all these great diseases, salmonella and other bacteria. Tell us what things you're worried about this Thanksgiving in terms of pathogens that can make people sick. Well, in addition to COVID, of course, because we have still have to watch out and maintain our social distancing and, and um, you know, vaccination status and whatnot. Um, of course, we hear every year about undercooking turkey and, the, and undercooking stuffing within turkey. Do you put stuffing in the turkey? Do you cook it separately? Um, having undercooked food, of course, leads to bacteria growth, and that, uh, of course, leads to people getting sick. And, you know, uh, so I don't know if you know this, but uh, my grandmother used to make her own gefilte fish. So gefilte fish is, a, you know, it's the worst tasting stuff you've ever heard, <laughs> but it's a, it's, a, it's a Jewish thing. And they take white fish and uh, put in uh, matzo meal, 
yep. and, and and constantly taste it, and then everybody in the community gets sick. <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> well, exactly. So uh, again, you're not cooking your fish. You're you're tasting raw foods, and that's of course a uh, risk for transmission. I grew up in an Italian family, and my mom, when she was making meatballs, would taste the meatball mix. It's ground hamburger, and 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 fortunately nobody got sick from that. But uh, and raw eggs go in that as well. And so it's, it's, again, any raw food exposure increases the chance. You know, of that. the other the other thing about it, we've been so obsessed with COVID, tuberculosis is rampant. We've set a world record, I think, this year for a million and a half deaths. And before that, remember, we had C. diff in mm -hmm. MRSA. And people are always worried about, you know, these, these pathogens that were getting in locker rooms and yep. stuff. What happened to that? It's those. They're still here, aren't they? Yeah, they're they're, they're all still here. I mean, I think the um, you know I think the, some of the measures we're taking to uh, avoid COVID transmission are having an impact on these other diseases. Right, right. It's just keeping people away from each other, uh, improving our cleaning, cleanliness and our uh, cleaning practices are, are having a benefit for these other infections. You know the uh, so one of the interesting things in the world of, of uh, bacteria is there have been almost no new developments in how to fight them. And all these chemicals that we use, that are, they're antibiotics. Overuse has led to resistance, and Dr. Mugasso has the coolest stuff going on, which is these viruses that actually attack uh, bacteria. So can you tell us about what they, what they are and how they work? Sure. So we've, as Joe mentioned, we've gone through this uh, terrible time with, with a b really bad virus. And I think it's created a stigma where you know, all viruses are, are, are bad, and most are, but uh, there's a certain type of virus called a bacteriophage, which infects only bacteria. And uh, we have adapted uh, these viruses to be able to address the problem you mentioned of antibiotic resistance, because largely pharmaceutical companies have gotten out of making new antibiotics. Bacteria evolve very quickly, and so companies don't want to invest in, in, in chemical structures that are destroyed within a month of introduction into the market. Uh, but viruses adapt, as we've seen with the COVID pandemic, very quickly, right? As the Delta variant arose after, after a while in the human host. The same is true for these bacteriophage. And so we've developed a program in the laboratory to be able to evolve them to better target certain bacterial strains and then created a pipeline where we can make them safe to be able to put them in people that have no options for antibiotic therapy. And you've had some successes, right? There was a paper I read of yours that was taking a patient who had bad uh, urinary tract infection. Yes, in this case, uh, a clinician in, in California came to us and said, we, have, we no longer have antibiotic options for this person. It was a, a UTI plus a, a prostate infection, and they thought this person, this person was not going to make it because the bacteria were going to spread to the blood. And so they sent us their bacterial strain, and we screened our library of good viruses for ones that kill that strain, and then we made a cocktail of them so that resistance could not develop, essentially cutting off the ability of the bacteria to become resistant. The patient received the treatment and, and had a really good outcome, and, and since then we've done 12 of these. Wow. And That's we awesome. are we're in the process of, of potentially in the next year to 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 exceed thirty, because we have about forty in the works. And how do you do? You grow it up here. You grow the virus here, and then how do you give it to the patient? So um, the the first step is we need the strain. So if a right. clinician right. has a strain and there's no antibiotic options, they could send it to us. We created a program to be able to receive the strain. And we love getting bacterial pathogens that no, mm -hmm. there's no cure for here at Baylor College Medicine. Absolutely. It, yeah. Yes, because we also sequence them and learn why they're <laughs> yeah. learn why they're bad. Yeah. Um, so the first step is to identify good viruses that will hit the, the target pathogen. And then after that, uh, we have an amplification program to grow a lot of it because a lot of it is needed to administer to the patient. And then we have a third program where we make sure that what is actually going to be given is safe. Right. So is it sterile? Does it have um, toxic elements, et cetera, that may be carried over from the purification? And so we're trying to create this pipeline that is really the first in the world to be able to do this. And I think we're the leader in the world. How do you give it? Is it IV? It, it's a clinician call. Okay. So, uh, depending on the type of infection, it, it most of these are given, because these patients are pretty critical, right. most is given through like a PICC line or, yeah, or, or mm -hmm. through an IV. Um, intravenous is desired at the moment, but we have topical treatment too, we've yeah. done. External treatment of catheters and LVAD devices. Oh. Uh, and then um, 
also direct injection into the site. And so sometimes bacteria wall, the, the host walls off an infection and the antibiotics can't penetrate and we've injected these phage directly in the abscess uh, or in a peritoneal sort of walled off granuloma uh, to get phage right in that in that site and, and that's worked too. So. Well this is, uh, it's great, I mean this is really just so everybody knows this is revolutionary, there's nothing like it and it may revolutionize our ability to uh, treat bacteria without antibiotics. So very exciting work, really glad you guys spent the time to tell us about it and have a wonderful Thanksgiving and don't eat uh, raw gefilte fish or right. turkey. <laughs> Have a great Thanksgiving too. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Willie's coming. Willie's coming. Willie's coming. You know, uh, every Thanksgiving there's a tradition that, uh, you know, the ho there's one holiday turkey that we have to pardon. Uh, and this year I get the honor of pardoning the, uh, the holiday turkey. So I'm very excited about this. If you bring in the holiday turkey, please, uh, I really want to pardon the... Lily, you you can't be pardoned. You've been a oh, you've been a bad girl all week. You're not pardoned. Well, wait a minute. It is Thanksgiving, and so so we are. Lily and I want to wish you a happy Thanksgiving. And Lily, I'll forgive you for all the stuff you did, but boy, you were a bad girl this Thanksgiving. So have a happy and a healthy Thanksgiving. <laughs>